Welcome back to Seeker Strength and today we are bringing back the pay-per-view. So we took a hiatus from the pay-per-view and we are back again. We're going to be hopefully bringing you pay-per-views every week again for the next couple of weeks and hopefully bring you some new and interesting stuff in the uh, realm of sport and exercise science. So today's paper is investigating the effects of heat on training and a particular style or a particular strategy that these researchers employed on judo athletes and to see if it was effective in reducing the effects of heat on these athletes during training and to see if this would attenuate and improve potentially the time to kind of start that recovery process post training. So heat obviously has a variety of different potentially negative impacts on athletes during training. If we're in a hot and humid environment, we are at the risk of dehydration, heat shock, heat stroke, reduced cerebral blood flow, uh, poor coordination and a variety of other different impacts that are all negative for training, not that those previously mentioned impacts are enough in themselves. So the effects of heat and training is well investigated. There is a lot of different studies investigating cooling strategies on athletes during training and during competition. A lot of those focus on pre and post training strategy. So cooling before training and cooling after training. For example, the pre cooling before training doesn't seem to be quite as effective as while it does take a little bit longer to get up to those temperatures and those potentially dangerous higher temperatures, it still happens and you spend a longer time at those temperatures. The post cooling training effect seems to be quite beneficial and it does seem to have a little bit more beneficial effects than the pre training. The intra-training effects are something that haven't been massively well studied. And in this research paper, these researchers from Spain were trying to investigate this on elite level judica athletes. So the title of our paper is Intermittent Cooling During Judo Training in a Warm and Human Environment Reduces Autonomic and Hormonal Impact. So what we had was 16 different high level judica athletes. These were 21 plus or minus two years. These were at least a first Dan black belt in judo and at least had to have a medal in a national event within the last two years. So before the investigation, they brought these athletes in and did what is known as a randori maximal time to exhaustion for each of the judoco. Essentially what this is, is they were looking to figure out kind of what these athletes limits. This is similar to a VO2 max, same kind of principle, with a different a couple of different things involved in it. It was like a wind gate, some judo specific stuff. And there's actually a paper from the same researchers they're investigating and solidifying and kind of bringing that method of the randori maximal time to exhaustion for combat sports athletes. Essentially what it is, is they were trying to test kind of the limits of these athletes and their kind of maximal capabilities. They first began by, of course, getting the athletes permission to do the study, get their metrics, height, weight, age, all of that good stuff. Then they got their wellness, so a variety of different questions, psychology, psychometric analysis, just to see how well the athletes sleeping, how well they felt, how they were during training, post training, etc. They took the athlete's temperature via an ear monitor, took quite a number of different time points and frequencies over a couple of different seconds to ensure that the highest point was recorded and this was used in as these athletes temperatures. The athletes were then put comfortably in a chair and their heart rate variability was measured. So this is one of the things they measured or one of the things that they're kind of relying on to interpret their data and see what effect the cooling had on these athletes. And that was the measurement of HRV or heart rate variability. Now there's a lot of different stuff around heart rate variability. There's a lot of pros and cons to it. There's a lot of nuance to it. And there is a lot of kind of skepticism around the place. It was originally when it came out initially, People thought HRV was going to be the thing, it was going to be super useful to record. Uh, in the scenario for the everyday athlete, it isn't proving that useful, but for the use in investigative studies, it is a valuable metric at times. The athlete's hormones or salivary hormones are measured. So they measured their DHEA or dehydroepiandrogesterone and cortisol, and then they use this to calculate the ratio between them. Salivary measurement of DHEA and cortisol is well established as a good method or an accurate method for measuring these levels. So they've done studies where they measure people's salivary DHEA and cortisol, and then correlated or at the same time took their blood measurements, which would be a very accurate measurement or a sure way of measuring it. And they have shown that there is a high correlation between the two of these and quite a rapid response between blood levels of DHEA and cortisol and then DHEA and cortisol in the saliva. Finally, the last measurement they were using was grip strength. So this is quite a common one for kind of parasympathetic activity or central nervous system fatigue. Uh, it's quite well established in terms of monitoring fatigue in studies and it's been around for a long time. And it's quite interesting that they're using it here. Again, in this scenario, then they're relating this to the grip fighting in judica or judo fighting. So it is quite interesting that they use this and quite specific to these athletes abilities and quite specific to the activities they were doing 
but grip strength is still a useful measurement of CNS activation or lack of activation or fatigue. So then the actual intervention was the athletes or rather split into two groups, eight in one group and eight in the other, four men and four women in each group. Then one group did their prescribed amount of sparring. Both groups did the same amount of volume, same amount of sparring. The difference was the cooling group wore a cooling vest. They wore this for five minutes between bouts and then they wore this cooling vest for 10 minutes post session to see if there was any effect. Now, I know we're talking about intra session cooling, so it's a little bit sneaky, I think, to put that in there after, but we'll get to that later. Now, for the results of that. Up next, we have the results section. So to start off the results section, we look at RP and wellness. So RP, rate of perceived exertion. Wellness was just uh, achieved through a questionnaire. In terms of both these values, you typically think you'd see quite good findings here, right? An athlete who's able to cool down more effectively. Uh, temperature and atmospheric conditions have been long known to affect uh, the rate of perceived exertion or the ratings of such during exercise, right? So. The findings are no significant difference between the vest group and the control group in either wellness scores or rate of perceived exertion scores. So that is something where this these set of data will kind of contrast what we've seen previously in the literature. Up next is HRV, so heart rate variability. Next week, we actually have a video coming out that focuses very heavily on heart rate variability and its usefulness as a tracker for, for kind of nervous system fatigue. But right now, Heart rate variability, all you need to know is if you have a large range in your heart rate variability, your nervous system is quite relaxed. If your heart rate variability is very low, your nervous system is under stress, right? Or it would kind of be indicative of a nervous system that was under stress. So in the post-test uh, analysis, the VEST group had higher ranges in HRV, the control group had lower ranges in HRV. So this would suggest that possibly you're getting some sort of, of moderation of that central nervous system fatigue or possibly dissipation faster of central nervous system fatigue when using the cooling vest. In the isometric hand grip test, there was no difference between control group and vest group. There's no difference between dominant hand and non-dominant hand either. So it appears as though in terms of isometric strength in the with a, a hand gripper, uh, there is no difference. Then on to the hormonal markers, so DHEA. DHEA was uh, maintained in the control group, basically going from pre-testing to post-testing. There was no significant difference across the group. What we did see though was a significant increase in DHEA going from uh, pre-testing to post-testing. So in the vest group with that sort of artificial uh, cooling, we had a significant increase in DHEA from pre to post testing. And then finally, in our hormonal group, we had cortisol. So salivary cortisol was slightly decreased when compared between the control, control group and the vest group. So that would be kind of concurrent with the uh, increase in DHEA. But it is interesting, cortisol or salivary cortisol in particular is something we constantly look at as a kind of stress marker in almost all exercise science studies. So the fact that the VEST group are seeing a small decrease in cortisol, uh, that, that kind of artificial cooling might actually have something beneficial going on. So before we get going with the discussion, just want to say overall, we do like the study. I know a lot of times we do studies where we're like, okay, there's a lot of issues with this study or why these results aren't great because of the study design. But what they were trying to investigate is good and the way they went about it doing it I think was effective they had you know high level athletes they had them in the environment they wanted them in they had a reasonable number of athletes in terms of high level athletes they had fairly concise but pretty meaningful metrics that they used to measure and then they had a fairly interesting study design or piece of equipment that they were using to kind of insert into the training of the athletes so overall I thought it was pretty uh, I thought it was pretty good yeah, I think for study design, one place a lot of studies in my eyes fall down is that they test loads and loads of things. Mm -hmm. And instead of having the list of like five or six things we have here, they'd have a list of 18 or 20 things and then only two or three things become actually important. And I think you lose a lot of like the signal to noise ratio goes out the window a bit on, on some of those studies. I think this is nice. It's like refined they know what they're looking for in their study design and, and they get it with the study, you know, definitely there's no fluff. You know, it's, I mean, we can only look up to things like, for example, on its measurement for the Boston memories thing, you know, that's like, that's the gold standard for, Jesus, there we go. So a little dig. So first thing I want to talk about is just the DHEA to cortisol and DHEA and cortisol measurements. 
uh, DHEA and cortisol in relation to exercise are quite interesting and there's a lot of different implications from those. DHEA has a plethora of impacts on the body from neurosteroids, andro receptors, has some weak interaction with the eastern receptor, has a variety of different impacts. It is correlated uh, to levels of testosterone and dehydrotestosterone, which all have a variety of different effects. So all of these things are hugely impactful on exercise in relation to exercise. It is actually used as a supplement. You can buy it over the counter in America. It is, however, banned by WADA. WADA, Big Daddy WADA. Has, that means it definitely works. That, that means it definitely does something, uh, DHA. The investigations on supplementation of DHA and exercise usually show essentially no change. Sometimes you might see in female athletes a reduction in uh, fat mass, maybe a little increase in power performance, but very, very minimal. They're not considered statistically significant. Most of them in males will actually show a change in testosterone sometimes, but not really meaningful in terms of its impact on fat-free mass and stuff like that, which is typical of things that increase testosterone. It's very rarely in a meaningful factor. But in relation to exercise, it is useful because their DHEA and cortisol are changed and are, can be adversely or positively or negatively affected after exercise. For example, cortisol has a kind of threshold for its impact. It can either go up or down post-exercise, and this seems to be via an intensity modulator. So there seems to be a a level of intensity or benchmark for intensity where you start seeing cortisol to raise post-exercise. And I suppose you can probably imagine cortisol getting the name of being that stress hormone. You'd imagine more intense exercise, higher intensity exercise results in increase in, in cortisol. And then you are, of course, correct. Gold star for you. So that increase in higher intensity exercise tends to result in people having higher cortisol, but then moderate or lower intensity exercise can often reduce cortisol in certain people. For example, aged individuals, if they were to do kind of moderate intensity exercise, might see a reduction in cortisol post-exercise. So it is quite interesting. The change in cortisol and DHEA post-exercise are quite dynamic, and it is very interesting that they picked the two of these for a study. Uh, like we said, the use of salivary testing for DHA and cortisol is quite accurate and has been well reputed. So it is, uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes salivary indicators of hormones isn't very, very useful. But in this case, it does seem to be. One thing I found very interesting was the, the RP value. So how exerted the athletes felt um, and the lack of, of difference between the groups. A common thing we'll see in cooling interventions uh, or in any kind of alteration of rest period intervention is that RP will usually be a, a, a quite significant kind of mover and shaker in there, you know? So like if you change someone's resting conditions, if you change the condition of intra-workout uh, recovery, usually RP is one of the first things to change. Um, and heart rate and, and things along those lines and heart rate variability will, will kind of follow thereafter. I think in this case, the possible factor uh, for not changing RP will be the the experience level of the athletes so they're they're well accustomed to very hard training and that could just be it you know the athletes could be so used to heavy training they understand their exact uh, level of exertion and then their rate of perceived exertion is directly influenced by that or or the lack of influence it would have over it by that uh, could kind of be explained by that level of experience what is interesting is the HRV values you know that that apparent cooling down of the uh of the the parasympathetic nervous system that the ability for for a change in temperature like what i really would like to have seen is like some core body temperature uh, measurements be taken i know you can get the the kind of pill thermometers that you just scan with the scanner get someone to swallow it they'll pass it after 16 to 24 hours i would have liked to see that and i would like to see that the kind of following on of hrv change with that increase or decrease in body temperature you might see during the kind of resting condition versus the control condition but there is definitely some interesting outcomes of this study the interesting thing i think they opened or the interesting question they brought up here as a result of this study is the fact that would this change with a longitudinal study and how would that impact athletes training adaption so typically what we'll see is cold post training is not what you want to do especially if you're looking for a hypertrophic effect you're typically seeing that this hypertrophy effect is blunted if you interact with a very cold environment post-training. Uh, strength and skill adaptions are a little bit different, but likely quite negative adapted eventually, or you might be blunting some of that effect. So it's certainly not a great thing post-training. But 
kind of what they're suggesting here is what the results are suggesting and their interpretation results is that the intercooling during the training just got those athletes back to the recovery state faster so they would have started recovering faster and the question then would be did this negatively impact the recovery process the metabolic process the hormone cascades post training that result in positive training adaptions uh, the answer is we don't know and it is interesting the a longitudinal study on this with different groups would be great with similar levels of athletes of course it's very very difficult to do that but it is something interesting and it'll be very interesting to see if at some point someone does bring that up uh, that the does the intercooling have the same kind of slight negative effects or potential for negative effects post cooling in training for me i think the last point would be just on the actual practical application of this for normal athletes I just think it's a bit clunky, you know, and it's kind of where that that academic world might meet practical or pracademic worlds, you know, where where people look at papers, try and implement things in their own training. This isn't necessarily something you're going to be able to implement if you go to your local judo gym or or whatever. If you're in the weight room moving weights, and like it's going to be difficult to put on a cooling vest in between your sets, you know, and. It is definitely something these papers are important as kind of gateways uh, or little peepholes into the realms of possibility for, for exercise science. But in this case, it's probably not going to be a paper that a coach will read or a coach will interpret from somewhere else uh, and directly implement. I think if you do see the implementation of this with athletes, it will probably be in like professional sports where you have to get an athlete acclimatize the training or competing in a certain environment very very quickly so if you have a, a lions rugby tour going to south africa and it's 38 or 40 degrees in in some of their training environments then i think something like this could be quite useful you know limit that amount of stress overall limit the increase in stress that might come along with the increase in core body temperature while training and in that case it could be valuable but i think for most people training in most normal environments you probably won't see this study directly affecting their training what you might see is multiple iterations further down the line whether that be with an easier piece of equipment or an easier protocol uh, being implemented in a normal training session one of the negative impacts for this potentially if you're to implement this in you know sub 30 degrees or kind of in that uh ambient room temperature environment if you're to use this it'd probably have a negative impact on your performance you're looking at you know reducing core body temperature uh, which would potentially reduce the elasticity or tendons, which is one of the benefits of warming up. So using this in an environment where it's not super hot would definitely be a poor, poor action, I would think. Uh, one other thing as well is it's unsure or unclear if this would have long, long-term long impacts on athlete's adaption in relation to internal temperature control. So temperature control or internal modulation of temperature is very important for athletes. It's very important for everyone for, for living. You know, when there's heat waves, thousands of people die across for example Europe and stuff for people who are not well adjusted to very high temperatures specifically older people because they lack this ability for internal temperature regulation so it's one of the benefits of sauna seem quite useful and also cold plunges seem useful in that regard so would using this in between sessions potentially long term have negative impacts on the athletes I would would be inclined to say intuition would say probably you know if you're lacking some of that robustness if you're removing some of the stress of training you're also losing some of the benefits of training so I think for maybe an environment where you were trying to be fast and heavy in your maybe competition environment or last few weeks of training camp where you're just trying to be best quality sessions but not looking for the most long-term adaption, probably useful. But I would think a long-term use of this, I don't think it would be the best idea.